Good afternoon. I welcome everyone to Security and Context online panel. My name is Eli Haddad, and we are coming to you live from Beirut and the U.S. Today is the 4th of April, 2023. This afternoon event is titled Shooting the Messenger, Journalism and Warfare in the MENA region. Many thanks to all of you. And Maria, please. Uh, thank you, Eli. And it's not only from Lebanon and the U.S. We have different parts of the world uh, today. So uh, our panelists are joining us from different parts of the world. Good afternoon, everyone. Welcome to today's webinar on the safety of journalists in the MENA region. This event is organized, as, as mentioned by Eli, by the, by the Security and Context Initiative. My name is Maria Bouzid, and I will be the host and moderator for this session. The media landscape in the Middle East and North Africa region is complex and often challenging, with a growing number of threats to the safety and security of journalists. This panel will focus on critical aspects of safety for journalists in the, re in the region, such as physical safety, digital safety, as well as mental well-being. Before we begin, I would like to take a moment to greet our esteemed panelists who have joined us today. Before each speaker's presentation, I will provide more details on their background and expertise. But for now, let me introduce them by name and title. Basim Suisi, Tunisian social activist, George Aid, senior broadcast journalist and executive news producer. Jesse Khouri, associate professor of media studies and director of international relations at Notre Dame University, Louise and the U. Orhan Sener, journalist and media lecturer, last but not least, award-winning journalist Sharif Abdel Kudus. We are grateful to have such a knowledgeable and experienced group of panelists with us today, and we hope that this discussion will shed light on the urgent need to protect the safety and security of journalists, given the vital role they play in promoting democracy and the human rights worldwide, and especially in our region. Welcome to our speakers and our audience. We're excited to have you here and looking forward to an insightful and product productive webinar. Let's start first with Orhan Sene. Orhan is a highly experienced journalist, media consultant, and academic who has made a significant contribution to the field of communication studies in Turkey. He has a bachelor's degree in business economics and a master's degree in information, communication, and society from City University in London. Since 2019, Sener has been serving as the director of, of the Journalism Academy of the Journalists' Union of Turkey. Thank you for being with us, Orhan, and the floor is yours. Thank you very much. Uh... So my name is Orhan Şener. Uh, as Maria has just mentioned, I am the director of the Journalism Academy of the Journalist Union of Turkey, and I also teach at various universities in the communication schools. So uh, I'm seeing that uh, other, uh, uh, other colleagues here are also coming from countries where they are probably as experienced as I am. But when it comes to press freedom, security of journalists and such issues, it is mostly like uh, people feel the need to call someone from, from Turkey, right? So there is a need for that. Why? Because Turkey, unfortunately, despite being considered as a democracy or a semi-democracy, it is also the country which has almost as many journalists as it is in China. So we are just coming up to China. Sometimes we, we are the first or sometimes we are the third. So China, Russia, and Turkey, sometimes Saudi Arabia. So this is that. Not anymore, actually, because the government had changed their tactics. But um, I would like to inform you in, the, in these like 10, nine minutes about what uh, a malign government can do to oppress it is not only because it's especially in journalists are killed, that is a problem. If they are put in the jail, that is a problem. If they are beaten, that is a, but there are many ways to oppress journalism, which we are now experiencing. So first of all, the classical things. Uh, in the last five years, the number of um, arrested journalists has, been, has dropped from about like 150 to, it is approximately 25 to 30 now. It's not because journalists, the, uh, uh, 
freedom of expression and media freedom is be becoming uh, more liberal or things are getting better, but it's only because the government does not want international uh, watchdogs or any international body to come to them and ask about those journalists. So now the number is 25 or 30, but the oppression, the level of oppression is even more extreme. First of all, they have oppressed journalists so much that most of the prominent independent and sometimes opposition, I don't want to call journalists opposition, but you know what, what, what I'm trying to explain, uh, are now in exile. And secondly, uh, instead of putting them in jail, the government is using slaps, um, many legal cases, to put a burden on them, financial, psychological, and also in, in, in terms of their image uh, among the public, they are dealing with those um, legal trials. And because they are not financially that strong uh, and they are already dealing with so much trouble in the country, it is a huge problem, not only for the journalists themselves, but also for the media outlets too. And secondly, uh, when time comes, not killing them, but beating them is really common, especially now just in 40 days, we will have one of the like most important elections of our uh, republic history, um, especially um, if you're a journalist that is associated with any of the opposition parties, and if you come up with something critical against the government or the president or someone, important around them, there is this possibility that you might be beaten, not by the police, not by someone directly affiliated with the, by the, with the government, but it will look like some random guy passing through and they will always have an excuse to do that. But at the end of the day, everyone will know who did what, uh, with what reason, yeah? But these are not the only things. We also have censorship. We have so many, censored websites, even PayPal in Turkey is uh, censored. If Booking.com does not work. Wikipedia used to be censored. YouTube used to be censored. Twitter, not only censoring the whole website, but also uh, limiting the bandwidth of the website. Now, uh, Deutsche Welle Turkish, for example, because they are not complying with the regulations dictated by the government, they need to close up their office in Turkey. Um, and censorship is not only for the news, but it can be about any kind of program that is on TV because TV is the most important medium that most people receive their news because, I mean, most people are not that literate in the country and they tend to receive the news from the TV. So the government and the president does not want opposition and independent voices to be heard on the TV. That is why the regulatory body they really do not find any difficulty to come up with excuses to put like one, two or three days of um, turning off the channel or like some extreme measures that they need to pay uh, really huge amount, uh, amounts of large sums of fines uh, while the uh, media that is either controlled or um, oppressed by the government uh, it, it is not put under similar measures. And I would like to remind that according to various reports, at least 90%, but some also claim that 95% of the conventional media is either directly owned or controlled by the government or business people who are, have strong ties with the government. And we also have that as if those are not enough, we also have a special institution which was established after the new regime of the presidency. We used to be a parliamentary democracy, now we are a semi-presidential system, but basically it's a presidential system. And now, in addition to the ministries that we used to have, we also have lots of directorates. And one of the most important directorates is the information directorate. So there is a special director, which is controlling all of the flow of information in the country. And it is also known that such institutions, almost each government institution is claimed to own their own social media operative 
accounts, trolls or bots that are used to uh, manipulate, control and oppress the conversation in social media. And finally, these are the measures that they are using to prevent um, opposition voices, but that's not enough. You also need to have your own narrative. In order to do this, I would, I usually tend to claim that Turkey is probably one of the first post-truth countries in the sense that when you open the TV, if it's a government controlled media outlet, you will see a totally different parallel reality, as in the case of Trump's consultant claiming that it's a, there are alternative truths. Yeah, Even the price of the dollar, of the uh, statistical facts like the inflation or unemployment, you will not hear the same thing in government controlled media outlets and the independence one. So there are two different separate realities of the people who are supporting the government and people who are opposing the government. This is really an interesting case. And I believe that the world, especially the West, has a lot to learn from us. Well, I know that in MENA and many other countries, also in the Balkans, they understand us, but the West especially need to look carefully at those cases so that they can understand what the dangers are in front of democracy if they cannot protect their media. Thank you. Thank you very much, Orhan. Very inspiring as usual. Uh, let us move to uh, Sharif. Uh, Sharif Abdul Quddus is an independent print and television journalist. He has reported from across the Arab world, including Egypt, Palestine, Syria, Libya, Yemen, Iraq, Bahrain, and Algeria, as well from across the United States and internationally. He received a George Fork Award for his investigation into the killing of Palestinian journalist Shirin Abu Akli and an Emmy Award for his coverage of the Trump administration's Muslim, Muslim travel ban and an Easy Award for his coverage of the 2011 Egyptian Re Revolution. Welcome, Sharif, and uh, you can proceed. Uh, thank you for having me on today. It's an honor to be on with everyone. Um, I just want to focus these 10 minutes on uh, primarily on the crackdown and the stifling of the press in Egypt uh, over the last decade or so. Um, and, and to better understand where we are today in Egypt, it's important to look back very briefly where we're coming from. So prior to the revolution of 2011, under the autocratic rule of Hosni Mubarak, there were limits on freedom of expression and limits on freedom of the press. Uh, despite that, however, Egypt nevertheless had a relatively vibrant media scene with privately owned media outlets producing some very strong reporting. We had TV talk shows taking on controversial issues of the day. To the extent that Egypt stood out in the region as a country with a certain level um, of accountability journalism and independent reporting. And after uh, Mubarak was ousted in February of 2011, we saw this efflorescence of new media, new newspapers, new talk shows uh, coming out for a couple of years, which was very encouraging. And there was this cacophony of different perspectives. However, uh, since uh, the coup of 2013 and the army's takeover of the country led by Abdel Fattah al-Sisi, what we've seen is really an unprecedented crackdown on the press in Egypt. Uh, so there's a number of different aspects to this. The first and most obvious way is something Orhan alluded to as well is you know, to throw journalists in prison. So over the past decade, uh, Egypt has consistently uh, risen in the ranks to become one of the worst jailers of journalists in the world. Uh, for many years, it was a third worst jailer of journalists in the world, according to the Committee to Protect Journalists, behind Turkey and countries like China. Um, it also imprisons more journalists on charges of spreading false news than any country in the world. And so, and as is the case with thousands of political prisoners in Egypt, many journalists are being held in uh, pre-trial detention. So under Egypt's penal code, you can be held in pre-trial detention for up to two years without ever being convicted of a crime. And if the authorities want to keep you locked up past that two-year period, uh, they use this practice called tadwir or rotation or recycling, where after the two years have elapsed, they simply file new charges against you uh, and put you in a new case, and that resets the pretrial detention clock. And we've seen journalists and other political prisoners uh, being held for many, many years in this way. Uh, so imprisonment and arbitrary detention is just one way that the Egyptian authorities crack down on the press and create uh, an atmosphere of fear and in many cases, self-censorship. Another way, um, another a couple of ways is through censorship and acquisition. 
So uh, we can take a look at these methods. So since around 2017, uh, the government began blocking any independent website that carried any critical views or of or information about Egypt. So this not just applied to foreign organizations like Human Rights Watch, Reporters Without Borders, Al Jazeera, Al Hurra, even self-publishing platforms like Medium. But what was more acute as a problem was the blocking targeted 100% of independent media outlets in Egypt. So the number of news organizations that are not tied to the state that are reporting news from Egypt that is readily available to Egyptians is zero. Uh, you know, readers would have to download a VPN in order to circumvent the blocks and access these websites. So the government simply went around and blocked around 400 VPN websites, making it very hard for anyone to even get a VPN. So the number of blocked websites is so far is, is over 600. And they're all blocked, by the way, illegally. They're not relying on any uh, decree or regulation in Egypt's already authoritarian uh, legal code. Uh, it's just security agencies deciding to pull the plug on any media organization that carries critical views. Um, there's also other forms of legal harassment. So, for example, Madamas, which is Egypt's leading independent media outlet that is still existing despite this very hostile environment it finds itself in, is a very prime example of the methods the regime can use to target it without actually outright closing it or imprisoning its journalists. So, uh, you know, the website's been blocked since 2017, its offices have been raided, its journalists have been arrested multiple times with cases lodged against them, there's three journalists on trial right now, they face repeated legal harassment, um, and its foreign staff have been report, uh, deported or not allowed back into the country, and so forth. So this is all part and parcel of kind of controlling the message and the news, and after Sisi came into power, he started openly complaining about two things about critical or opposition voices um, expressed in the media, in newspapers, and also about the hours of political talk shows uh, that Egyptians turned into, turned to religiously uh, every evening to follow the news and learn what's happening in the country. So the, the way they combated this was that the general intelligence service went from one media outlet to another and simply bought it up. And this happened initially through quite quietly through a private equity firm called Eagle Capital. And they formed a company called United Media Services or Al Mutahada for the sole purpose of purchasing nearly all the privately owned TV stations and newspapers in the country. And we're at a point now where Al Mutahada is the largest media owner in the country. And the government now is actually open about this. It's a well known fact that United Media Services is owned by general intelligence, they even take pride in it. And essentially, we're in a situation now where all the media in the country, barring just a couple of independent media outlets that are blocked, is owned by intelligence services. You're in a situation where the headlines of every newspaper, if you pull them out every morning, are the same. Uh, there isn't a single opposition newspaper in the country. And there's one news bulletin that's read out on every TV station. So this is kind of a complete control. There's even a WhatsApp group of editors-in-chief of the main newspapers in the country where they receive instructions from the intelligence services um, about what to print, how to print it, sometimes the actual text of the articles themselves. So, for example, when Egypt's former president died in 2019 in prison, we saw the identical 42-word news item buried in the back pages of the newspapers announcing his death, not referring to him as a former president and so forth. And we learned later that this was an instruction delivered on this WhatsApp group. So uh, these are some of the ways. There's also you know, a complete news blackout in places like Northern Sinai. Uh, which journalists have effect effectively been barred from accessing for many years. And this region has been the site of a long running low level insurgency between militant groups um, who, who have become increasingly radical and violent and uh, the security agencies and the army. And so civilians in Sinai are caught in the middle of this battle um, where you know, they're subject to long curfews, cell phone blackouts, road closures, kidnappings and executions by militants, raids and arbitrary arrests by security forces. So this is a place that desperately needs a spotlight and news coverage, uh, and it's almost impossible to access. Um, you know, I have to say, despite these restrictions, Madamasra and other couple of independent outlets have done some stellar reporting on Northern Sinai by cultivating sources that live there and reporters that live there and using them anonymously to report the news. But overall, it's a pretty grim picture of how journalism has been strangled in many ways in Egypt. Um, and you know, we need 
proper widespread coverage desperately of what's happening in the country right now as it undergoes really seismic changes, um, you know, not just in the way of new levels of repression, but in the way that the state operates, in the way that the army and intelligence services have really taken over the bureaucratic uh, structures of the state, how they're transforming the urban landscape of Egypt cities, how they've driven the economy to the brink of default. These things are being covered by groups like Madamas and other places, but not in the drumbeat way that they should be if we had this vibrant media landscape uh, where journalists could operate with some modicum of freedom. Um, and I have to say there's, there's, you know, I paint a very grim picture, but there's also glimmers of hope and, and, and resistance. So for example, just last month, we saw the election of the journalist syndicate of a dissident candidate, Khaled al-Balshi, who, um, you know, is the editor-in-chief of something called Darb, which is a news outlet that was blocked by the authorities in 2020. Uh, he campaigned on um, uh, on, a, on a platform of independence of the syndicate from uh, the government. He campaigned on the release of imprisoned journalists, and he won this election of a very important institution. So uh, despite the dangers of this, journalists who are members of the syndicate came out and voted for him. So there, there is uh, there are these like pockets of resistance that happen. And groups like Meta Masra have mentioned several times continue to practice independent adversarial journalism in this very, very difficult context, and they manage to operate in the margins, and they provide us a model uh, of what could be, and the very uh, act of existence of a place like Madamast as an independent media outlet is in itself an act of resistance. So, the, so uh, you know, while there is this pernicious crackdown, I think that there are reasons and ways that we can think about uh, breaking out of them. Uh, I think I've gone over time. I was going to talk about uh, the killing of Shirin Abu Akhle as well, uh, a story that I covered very closely, but maybe we can get into that uh, a little later. Uh, thank you. Uh, and uh, it was great to end on a positive note to uh, shed lights also on the positive uh, initiatives and on the great uh, role that Madame Masser is playing because we all uh, we are all following uh, what Madame Masser is doing and it's really it's really great and uh, what we can also uh, conclude from the first two interventions that the situation is really getting worse everywhere. So here, if I want to jump in, I can say that uh, even in Lebanon, uh, the ranking of Lebanon in terms of freedom of expression is regressing every year. So uh, we have a lot of attempts to arrest the journalists and to put them in jail, but uh, we should uh, somehow... Uh, keep hope and we should go on. So let us see what is happening actually in uh, Tunis with Basim. Uh, please join me in uh, giving a warm welcome to Basim Suisi, who is a Tunisian social activist with a passion for promoting youth participation in decision-making, civic engagement and leadership education. Basim is currently the project manager of the Opinion Makers Project at the Munadara Initiative, which empowers a new generation of opinion leaders in Tunisia and Lebanon. He is also the producer and host of Migration Talks, the first specialized radio show on migration. Basim, the floor is yours. Thank you very much, Dr. Maria. So uh, as said by uh, Sharif, in order to understand the situation of journalists in Tunisia, we must first of all make a small historical and legal overview. Uh, in fact, the 2014 constitution in Tunisia, which was negotiated and approved in the wake of the 2011 revolution, provides for freedom of expression and freedom of the press and prohibits prior censorship. Uh, specific articles guarantee the right to privacy and personal data protection, as well as the right to access information and communication networks. However, this text contains vague language tasking the state with protecting sanct cities and banning takfir. Such language could act as a constitutional restriction on freedom of journalism. Otherwise, in 2011, the government adopted also the decree law 2011-115 on the press printing and publishing providers protections to journalists against imprisonment. However, Tunisia's press code does not provide bloggers and citizen journalists with the same protections afforded to traditional journalists. And as we know, today we have a new journalist, we have citizen journalists, we have bloggers who are working in order to promote human rights and who are working in order to, uh, uh, to, to simplify many things to uh, the public. 
Also, Article uh, 7 defines a professional journalist as a person holding a bachelor's degree who shares the news and ideas with the public on a regular basis. A journalist, according to this art article, also is also defined as a person who is employed by daily or periodical news agencies or audiovisual media and electronic, uh, electronic media. So, uh, as you may know, on July uh, 25th, uh, 20, uh, 2020, 11, President Saeed announced the dismissal of the Prime Minister in Tunisia and suspended the elected parliament and began uh, ruling by decree. So in September of that year, the presidency issued decree law number uh, 117, which suspended the 2014 constitution expect for its preamble and first two chapters. This document effectively concentrated and checked power in the hands of the president. According to Article 5 of this decree, the president assumed the prerogative to enact laws governing information, the press, and publishing. Also, since July 2021, 20, uh, President Saeed and his government have taken measures to uh, consolidate and influence the online media space. For example, the president dismissed and replaced the executive, executive director of the Tunisian television establishment, the country's national public television broadcaster, which maintains a popular online and social media presence. The move was in violation of the provisions of the key law 2011, which requires the, uh, the appoint, uh, appointment of the national television director take place in accordance with the obligatory opinion of the regulation authority which is ICA, the independent high authority for audiovisual communication uh, also a prior the president side seizure of extraordinary uh, powers in july 2020 11 members of the media were largely able to access government spaces and report on government affairs without obstruction However, the presidential administration has since limited its contacts with the press and journalists, including those working for fact-checking initiatives, continue to face challenges in verifying information from official sources. According to the SNGT and your report on press freedom re released in May 2022, there were 105 cases during the uh, preceding year in which officials interfered with journalists attempting to legally access information. Also, in March 13 of 2023, Tunisian journalists were banned from entering parliament to cover the first plenary session of the Assembly of People's Representatives, the, the, the new parliament uh, elected in 2023, and only representatives of national television and the government agency TAP have been granted access. And this constitutes another station of attack on the freedom of the press in Tunisia, which means that there is an effective return to the parliament of Ben Ali, where the journalists who will cover the work of the parliament have been chosen with a great pressure, uh, uh, precision and with uh, very broad recommendations. We can also see the the, uh, the report of the uh, National uh, National Union of Tunisian Journalists published on May 2022, uh, a spot with testimonies from journalists who have been overrun by the authorities for the simple fact to have done their job. This spot also contains a report uh, on excesses committed against journalists over the course of a whole year. So in one year, Tunisian journalists have been victims of 17 legal proceedings 105 breaches of the right to access to information, 27 have been physically attacked, 26 have been victims of incitement to hatred, 12 victims of abuse of detention, 3 of sexual, uh, sexual uh, harassment, 20 were verbally assaulted, and 64 were assaulted by law enforcement. Huge number, uh, numbers and the huge violations. Uh, also, in 2023, uh, the government adopted uh, a decree law number 54, includes 83 articles divided across five chapters, most of which impose prison sentences of up to six years, as well as fines uh, of up to uh, uh, approximately $20,000 uh, uh, on any person who commits a crime mentioned in the decree. This includes fabricating or disseminating fake news and rumors or what is referred to in the decree as fabricated or falsified documents. During the coverage period of the, uh, the last uh, leg legislative elections, several, several bloggers and journalists were prosecuted in military courts rather than civil courts. They were charged under the Code of Military Justice, which criminalized criticism of military and its commanders. 
So uh, I don't want to see more examples because I think that it's time to move to action and to find solution to make end to these violations. The actual regime must acknowledge that his efforts to dismantle the institutions of human rights and the role of law will only lead to repression and impunity in Tunisia. As a human rights uh, defenders and as engaged uh, journalists, uh, we stand up for human rights, we stand up for the uh, oppressed and abused persons, we stand up for our country, we stand up for freedom and democracy. Thank you. Uh, thank you very much, uh, Basim, and also thank you for these uh, alarming numbers that uh, you just uh, shared with us. And now, without any, without uh, further ado, I would like to introduce our next panelist, George Aid, who is a highly accomplished senior broadcast journalist and executive news producer with a wealth uh, of experience working in the international media industry. Currently based in Dubai, Aid serves as the editor in chief at Al Mashhad TV. In addition to his work in broadcasting, he is also a university lecturer. He has won numerous awards for his work, uh, for his work, including several European awards for his doc documentary Kalimera Min Beirut, which was produced in 2016. I guess George has a lot to share with us concerning safety in particular. So, George, uh, please, the floor is yours. Thank you, Dr. Maria. I've been pleased to listen to every single one of my colleagues. Uh, it was very, very interesting to look at this matter and this topic that we're discussing in different angles. I will launch my uh, discussion from Lebanon and where I spent most of my life working uh, as a reporter first and then as head of operations in MTV Lebanon. The main uh, thing is that, as you mentioned earlier, Dr. Maria, your uh, intervention, Lebanon was a pillar in democracy in the Arab world and a pillar also in freedom of speech. Even during the time I, I was uh, beginning my career in Lebanon, it used to be a lot different than the time I had left for Dubai. Different how? Uh, censorship has gone to a uh, new level. Criticizing uh, some politicians might lead you at a certain point today to jail or to legal harassment. Let's put it in this in this context. When I say legal harassment, I mean twisting the law to make you uh, go and come to court more than five times a week on a single uh, article based on truth and fact. Or just by mentioning that uh, this person was involved in a corruption case. Criticizing the president is out of question. And by criticizing, I don't mean defamatory language or anything that goes beyond our ethics of journalists. So uh, this has been a major issue. Every single day we have one or two or four uh, activists or journalists summoned to court or arrested at the airport just for criticizing the system the president during his presidency, now we do not have a president, uh, even for a single thing, which is his job, while we people were criticizing one of the apocalyptic explosions in the world, which was the Beirut port, they were dragged to court while those responsible for doing the uh, explosion itself were running free and giving speeches and talking to the media and doing press conferences. So people and journalists who were trying to uh, put the truth out there were being summoned, where uh, they had to pay uh, large sums of money uh, under the pretext that they were offending a person without a proof, although most of the reports that were done in the media had substantial proof of what was being discussed. This is a matter uh, that is happening, but we do also have in Lebanon another matter which has to do with security itself. As you know, we do have armed militias which are backed up by certain countries in Lebanon. And this has caused an unstable uh, ghetto-like environment when you wanna work on the ground. I have experienced it myself, getting uh, almost shot for going just to shoot a report about illegal uh, illegal uh, construction done by members uh, of a certain mil militia, and uh, suddenly I was I was accompanied by at least fifteen uh, 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 elements of the army, and suddenly two three people with a gun were just shooting at us. No one, of course, was arrested. They ran free. We were taken out of the place in Beirut, part of the of Beirut, and they were not held responsible for. Uh, let's not say shooting at a, at a journalist, shooting at a citizen, an unarmed citizen, 
just doing his job. And in other cases, when I was running the operations of MTV, I had to deal with journalists disappearing for a few hours. So there are areas in Lebanon where if you access, you will be invited to a long, and I might say a very long cup of coffee. So you might stay for three, four hours in the hospitality of a certain armed party. Your phone would be uh, shut down. You will not be able to contact any lawyer, even your TV station. And I had to figure out you, uh, with the security forces and uh, the army, I had to negotiate a way to get back my reporter to the station. Of course, at the end of the day, he was going to get out. There was no, uh, I mean, alternative. They wouldn't kidnap him for life. But this is a message to say, do not trespass us. This is our region. This is our autonom autonom autonomous region. We run the security. We run the rules. We say what happens. And we doesn't mean the Lebanese state. So we do have gray zones in Lebanon. Uh, I'm not, when I say, uh, when I say armed militias, I do mean many types of armed militias, those who are Lebanese and others who are not Lebanese. So there are, uh, let's say, regions in Lebanon which are not accessible to journalists. And sadly, these regions need to be investigated. They are usually a hub of drugs, of arm dealing, of illegal activity. And you, we do not have any uh, leverage over, uh, over them or even the right to talk about this. The third element is the threats that you can receive in Lebanon by opening a subject that, a subject that touches down on uh, the basic uh, dogma or, uh, or the basic uh, idea of a certain uh, militia. So if the militia finds that you are attacking their dogma, you are undermining their, uh, their stance, they will not hesitate in, uh, in going after you. I do here refer also and connect with Orhan, which also talked about something like that in Turkey, irregulars, uh, let's say the Bashi Buzuks of our days. <laughs> so that's an old irregular uh, Turkish army in the, in the 1800s and 1900s. So they used to go after people without being held accountable for their actions. So in Lebanon, we do have what they say is, the, 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 what, do they, what they call the public, their public. So whenever anything happens, if someone gets shot, or like at a certain, uh, we had once an uh, army officer getting shot during a landing uh, in, in, in an area in the, in the south of Lebanon because he did not ask the permission from, his, from a certain militia to land his helicopter. Uh, he was shot in the head. And in military terms, being shot in the head is a direct and precise uh, shot. It is not a mistake when you shoot someone in the head. So this is also something that we are experiencing as journalists. They would just unleash the rage of what they call the public. I would like to refer to one of, of, of the things that happened during the international court's investigation uh, after the assassination of Prime Minister Hariri. The Detlev Millis, which was the head of the investigation, visited certain areas in Lebanon in an attempt to gather information to serve the international tribunal that was held in the name of Lebanon. He was attacked by uh, no less than 12 women with uh, shoes in their hands, and he, would be, he was being hit on his head to leave the area. So this was the soft weapon, let's say. 12 women attacking a man, trying to do his job on behalf of the international court. On another occasion, we see a journalist being attacked or restricted from entering uh, an area. I would, like, I would like to divulge a small secret here. At the end, we had to find a negotiating point with these people, and we had to work in certain areas in our country. And in order to access these areas and work on certain topics, we, we did have to call someone they designated, she was a lady of a certain name, and tell her this team is going to this area. She had, she had no connection with the Lebanese state, just connected to the militia and taking her opinion on when is, in her opinion, the best time to access the area and how can we and who can we interview on an issue as simple as electricity or water or the inflation or something that has to do with the economy. And of course, you will be escorted by people on motorcycles following you all the way and telling you who to talk to and who to avoid. This is, in summary, the situation in Lebanon. Uh, in, a, in a certain way, also, one last thing that I will add, 
the political parties which have found in the past that the journalism has be, has been a nuisance to their political ambition have tried a new way during the 1990s they started interfering by paying and owning or sub owning because in, legally they could not own uh, a tv station or uh, a, journal, a magazine or a newspaper so they started investing in the tv stations and also affecting directly and placing people on their behalf in the newspapers in order to disseminate a certain propaganda uh, and everyone does it it's not one party in lebanon everyone plants someone in a certain institution to execute his way of thinking and may, they usually make it hard for someone independent to propagate the truth they always try to intimidate inside the institutions those who are telling the truth uh, in a non-biased way that's it thank you very much Thank you, George. We will definitely ask you about your coverage of the Beirut blast later on because it was also uh, something directly related to safety. But uh, let me uh, introduce our discussant for today's webinar, Dr. Jessica Khoury. Uh, Dr. Khoury is an associate professor in the Department of Media Studies and the Director of International Relations at Notre Dame University, Louise and DU. Uh, Dr. Khoury holds a PhD in mass communication with concent, uh, from Texas Tech University with a concentration on health communication and an MA in media studies. Uh, Dr. Khoury, I don't really envy you because you have a lot to say and you have a lot to uh, summarize from these insightful uh, interventions, uh, but uh, I'm sure that you will provide us with a very valuable commentary on the presentations and insights shared by our speakers. Uh, please, uh, the floor is yours. Thank you. And uh, yes, definitely, I want to thank you all for your insightful discussions uh, in relation to your own backgrounds and experiences related to journalism, safety and security. My task is definitely hard enough uh, after having listened to, to you all. I would like to start out, though, in line with the security and context, we need to be able to redefine security and ask ourselves, what is security? Should it be based on political power, war, supremacism, ideas of hegemony and hierarchies, weapons, fear, or should it be as security in context defines it as based on human well-being, global solidarity and livable planet? Well, the options are not too difficult to choose from. And that is exactly what our panelists, through their experiences, even though some shocking and are weigh heavily, have contributed to. With all due respect for your titles, allow me to address you by your first names and summarize accordingly. Orhan from Turkey was uh, referring to the freedom of the press and uh, gave us a bit of background about the government how the government in uh, Turkey has changed their tactics to inform about what government can do to oppress journalists and, jur and journalism as a whole, especially if they are killed or put in jail. They are, I mean, that becomes a problem that we all know, but there is other ways he told us of ways to suppress journalists. And this is equally important. So this is one uh, aspect that he was referring to. Also, he referred to censorship, censoring websites, different websites, limiting bandwidth even, and not only news, but also when we are seeing programs on television. So these are uh, extreme ideas, but very real to, to what's happening in Turkey. And we also he stressed on the idea of needing a narrative, our own narrative, that have alternative truth to see that. You won't hear the same stories, but there and in Turkey, as, if, as also shared by other countries, is that there are two separate realities, those supporting and those oppressing our reality. And uh, a concluding statement uh, from him was about the West. The West should learn from us and they should look carefully at the cases so that they are able to know how to protect media and our democracies and the uh, democracies as a whole. And then uh, Sharif also from Egypt was uh, related to cracking down on the press in Egypt and uh, very fond of the information that you have shared with us about the history that led to where the current state of Egypt is today as well with blockage or government blocking different websites, especially the independent media outlets 
which you have with with which uh, Sharif was noting over 600 sites blocked. And this is um, a huge uh, issue to be able to look at. Prior to the revolution, there were limits of media, Sharif said, but they had vibrant media and vibrant media scenes that stood out for the country that hold, and they held accountability. That is one really important term, accountability. And perhaps this is where the call the that passion to call out for nowadays with the new regime or the issues that they're dealing with, even with false news. And this is something also that Basim talked about, about false news or fabricating the news. Well, then who can, who defines what is false? If journalists are saying what is true, then who, who defines what is false and then get uh, punished? for something like uh, something of that kind. He also uh, continued on saying that journalism has been strangled in Egypt. It should have uh, systematic changes in the way the country operates and in how they have changed the whole entire urban landscape, which is really key component. And I will discuss these, inter uh, these uh, interventions uh, more closely uh, depicting it in a critical lens. We need to have a vibrant media landscape again. I think this is one of the major uh, resonating messages that we hear, or if not again, we should have. And um, But I like that he also, like uh, Maria said, he uh, ended with a positive, a bit of positive hope. And this is something that also Basim was trying to say that we need now action. So there is that positive, the pocket of resistance I like the term the pocket because it sounds so small compared to the whole. And but they do exist, the resistance to continue practice independent journalism for things to operate correctly and hopefully not only in the margins, but fully. So uh ba this takes us on to Basim. Basim uh a young activist uh, and uh, perhaps uh, relating to youth empowerment perhaps, and maybe later on in the questioning we can uh, hear more about about that but uh, Basim also took us through the whole uh, the history of where uh, to understand the current state to the history of uh, Tunisia and the constitution which I find uh, very very odd that new presidency or president administration would suspend a system that we that is uh, that is well needed that uh, we don't go backwards in time and said we should be moving forward and this is what you were referring to as the presidency suspending the 2014 constitution and uh, holding power only in the hands of the president when it comes to information and dissemination of that information. So it's consolidating uh, media and more so now the online media landscape, which is really important for the generations that we have and linkage, linking people together through the online platforms, uh, through the news, uh, news platform. So the presidential administration, uh, it's, uh, as uh, Basim has stated, is charges against journalists who are legally trying to access information. And that is a really key component that just stood out to me, is that yes, journalists are trying to legally do and pursue their jobs, yet they are being persecuted, if I if I may, to use that word, for, for doing so. So this is a really grave uh, issue. And same, likewise, it's uh, happening in all of these uh, regions and in different ways. And with George describing uh, Lebanon, which of course is very dear to my heart and uh, with the rest of the region as well. But of course, I am Lebanese of origin. So this is uh, speaks a lot. And I also experienced what he was uh, referring to during the fourth, uh, the August 4th explosion. And um, it's very, um, demotivating to see that Lebanon, as George said, was used to be a pillar and now no longer uh, the case with the changed landscape uh, where you can just end up going to court for saying or reporting the truth. And yet what he noted that the people that you are just by the pretext of offending people that you can go and be tried. And yet those who should be tried are not. So this is an idea of justice. 
that's not uh, that's not there and we can talk about more on the human rights for sure related to the, to that the concept that george talked about related to the armed militias and having causing these ghetto like um, uh, environments how you can access certain areas to be able to do your job all of these are all different ways in suppressing journalists and even what topics you could talk about that's uh, unheard of when we're talking about journalistic practices. Yet, we've heard it a lot today. I want to um, talk about bring in these ideas that you've shared, and I've really enjoyed uh, listening to all of you in the perspective of security and context. Okay, security and context believes that security can be achieved through challenging, dominating paradigms producing alternative knowledge on insecurity related topics and consolidating and expanding networks of individuals and institutions. As you have heard from these summaries and our discussions today, we were able to contribute to expanding networks and producing alternative knowledge as far challenging dominant paradigms that through the strength of the newly built network and the resonating messages from our panelists and our moderator, we can continue challenging these topics in society to achieve a paradigm shift. I'm trying, I will be on the optimistic side of things and play devil's advocate on others. So bear with me just a, a bit more and uh, please do so. In my it might sound cliche, but it is with their efforts and those in which they mentor, I'm talking about our panelists, that they give a voice to the voiceless. Journalists try to untangle uncertainties in society through various forms of communication on the different media platforms. However, is our security secure? With our panelists and their choice of advocating for the journalism profession, our security can be safeguarded but not all are. We know that the credibility is among the three principles that allow us to live together in society along with integrity and citizenship. However, the later do not function without credibility. A credible journalist, without ne needing to say, will then disseminate knowledge to society, allowing people to have a well-informed citizen, or sorry, to have a freedom of autonomy to make choices that matter in life based on being a well-informed citizen. And it is true that they say about knowledge is power. Sure, that could be another discussion and concern of ethics, but I am referring to it in a pursuit form when sharing information that actually has essence and used to empower individuals, communities, not to brainwash or manipulate them. Yet, are journalists free? The press is not, and it is highly restricted in the region, according to what we've heard from um, all of you and as well, Maria, uh, from the World Press uh, Freedom Index, that uh, where we have restrictions and also the reality that we see. I want to quote something. Uh, defend, uh, according to Hobby and Olson, defense of freedom of speech must be seen in connection with the issues of journalist safety in the field. Lack of security and self-censorship go hand in hand. We should be cautioned from embedding journalists as a strategy to military censorship because the increasing problem of immunity is not only on a local or global impact, but a global impact on the freedom of expression. And one must question, and here's where I play devil's advocate, and ask whether the idea with less censorship and greater levels of access are necessary or are a necessity and thus always guarantee freedom of the press. The news I want to say, and I would like to agree with Hajbi, that the news is partly talked into being. This is a great notion that news is alive and it is made so by journalists like yourselves and those who you mentor. Therefore, journalism in of itself is not simply a story, but a mix of interactions among different stakeholders in society and can be then considered by far one of the greatest weapons in society. Uh, journalists then portray the state's identity, however, still is cautious about two main challenges, job security and safety. 
Should words then like surveillance, harassment, and legal actions trouble journalists? Journalists around the world share the core norms of the profession, yet they experience journalism in diverse ways depending on their economic, cultural, social, and political context in which we all have seen and heard uh, with this. And that brings me back to today's session. I want to conclude with very few words, uh, actually a bit more than few, but this is where we're, where I'm heading. Our 30 future seconds, Dr. Khoury. I only need one. One minute, please. All right, our future depends on our records. Form, I want to say this, it's, it might sound primitive, but I think it's really important because it's of essence. Our future depends on our records formed by good journalism, which is the core of our future. Uh, the core cannot be suppressed. This is very core. This, this very core archives our day-to-day -day events detailing what will become our country's history. And this is to say the least. Journalists offer us warnings. They interpret what otherwise is hard for us to understand. They contribute to the socialization of societies. This is a huge factor and very prominent. I want to stress that shaping attitudes and beliefs is grand. And for that reason, they have ethical standards to abide by, of course. Failure to do so is a contribution to a failed system, a system which becomes obscured from the security leading to insecurity of the profession and the nation. However, it's not them, it's maybe the systems in which they are living in that contribute to that. I will end with since uh, because of time, I have a lot more to say about the profession of journalists. It's dear to my heart as well, like Lebanon, because I am also a broadcast journalist. So I will uh, conclude with saying and uh, resonating also another message: honest journalism in the in this idea of security and current honest journalism in the face of authoritarian regimes and police states is the highest form of courage and the most dangerous in the Middle East. This is said by Rami Khoury and I also will in the Neiman reports. There exists mass anger and emotionalism that is sparked by different people. And this is in itself also a war zone. It is said that the best journalists are those who confront the control mechanisms of their ruling power structure. They defy existing rules, run against them and this is something that we see from your the perspectives that you're trying to share with us that we need to be activists perhaps in in our own systems so we might not have independent media but we can still say we have independent journalists who care about the state identity and societal well-being so thank you all on my on my uh, thank you i want to say thank, thank you, you dr Khoury. this is really Thanks. Yes, this is what we call food for thought. So thank you. It was uh, more than a summary, more, more than uh, a commentary. So thank you also for giving us uh, food for thought, as I just uh, mentioned. Uh, I will change a little bit the format because uh, we had a lot of uh, ideas, insights, and uh, instead of having the last 15 minutes for questions and answers, I will uh, give... Uh, each uh, speaker like two minutes for concluding remarks, uh, remarks for comments on other uh, uh, countries or other uh, uh, presentations. So let me also reshuffle the order. I will start with uh, Sharif. Uh, Sharif, would you like to uh, uh, give us some uh, concluding remarks, some uh, ideas uh, that uh, you were uh, that you would like to comment on based on the different uh, interventions? Well, I think uh, something that's uh, what's striking actually hearing from in different countries in different contexts is actually the similarities in the tools that are used to repress uh, journalists and, and stifle the media. So from legal harassment to imprisonment to controlling the media landscape. Uh, so these tools are actually quite crude um, and are um, copied uh, in different ways, different authoritarian uh, forms of power learn from their counterparts in the best way to kind of suppress uh, and stifle the media. For example, in Egypt, you know, I mentioned Madame Masr. It's, it's to me still incredible that Madame Masr exists given uh, this incredibly hostile atmosphere. How does it exist? It exists because Egypt, this regime cannot 
uh, continue to function without the diplomatic, economic, and political support from outside countries uh, and, and many Western benefactors from whom it purchases massive amounts of arms and keeps this relationship going. Part of that, uh, and I'm not saying that these Western governments care about a free press in Egypt, but when they come to arrest people at Madamasr and try and shut down this outlet, people in these Western, um, more democratic countries then are outraged. And the press in France, in, in uh, the US, is outraged and covers uh, this and makes a big deal out of it. And so it looks very bad for the administrations of these countries who then pressure the Egyptian administration. So it's these types of kind of solidarities from journalists around the world and from people around the world, really, that can combat these actually authoritarian uh, networks of power. And so I think that, you know, they learn from each other, uh, these authoritarian um, uh, regimes. They learn from each other and how to stifle the press. You know, Donald Trump started the whole fake news thing and Egypt now imprisons more people on charges of spreading false news. I think there is a connection there. It made it more palatable to be able to say that. So I think uh, in contradiction to that, we can also learn from each other as members, as a journalistic community, um, as, as people who digest the news as well, of ways to combat that and of ways of finding spaces uh, to continue to work and to continue to resist and continue to report. Uh, thank you, thank you, Sharif. Uh, let us uh, take the concluding remarks of Bassem. Uh, thank you uh, for, for you, Dr. Maria, and all the speakers. So, so I, I think that uh, journalists face almost the same challenges in different countries mentioned by all the speakers uh, with small differences depending on the different uh, culture and context of the country. But uh, uh, to summarize, I find that journalism is one of the pillars of democracy. And without uh, a neutral and committed journalist, uh, we cannot have uh, a strong society and we, we cannot have uh, have a cohesion in our societies. This is why we have to work in order to uh, preserve the uh, freedom of journalism in our countries. And we have to, uh, to work in order also to create uh, coalitions between uh, our, the journalists in our countries and all the journalists in our region, in MENA uh, region, in order to uh, also improve the coordination between all the journalists in the region uh, and in order to have a strong, uh, a strong coalition that can uh, improve the situation of journalists in all the region and also in order to defend the human rights and the causes that uh, that are essential in order to uh, to have strong societies. Uh, yes, Basim, I uh, totally agree with you. So we do have to work uh, towards promoting the safety and protection of journalists. But apparently today, from the discussion, we can also notice that freedom of expression is directly linked to this issue that we were trying to discuss. So uh, the discussion was mainly centered on freedom of expression because this is where uh, somehow the problem starts. So thank you, Basim, for uh, raising this. And I will go to uh, George, but George, I have to influence somehow and to uh, 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 try to uh, put pressure on you to talk in your concluding remarks about your uh, experience with the, the uh, the safety experience somehow while reporting about the Beirut blast because you were one of the first reporters to be uh, 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 on the scene. Thank you. Thank you, Dr. Maria. Before I talk about the Beirut explosion, which I've buried for a long time in my mind, it was, to be honest, a traumatic experience. I would like to uh, to point out to an idea that I really appreciated, and Sharif was talking about it, about learning from each other. They are, effectively, they are. Uh, it's a pattern. Uh, the systems are learning from each other. The, the governments are learning from each, from each other. I think we either have to change, doctor, the syllabus or the teacher. <laughs> it's not working well, what they're learning. <laughs> so we have to influence them in, a, in, in the opposite direction. It's becoming worse. So that said, I would like to point out at, uh, at what happened in Beirut, uh, security, of course, there was no security. It was zero security at the time. The country was 
barely able to, I mean, the capital was barely able to stand on its feet. Uh, blood and death and, uh, and, and wounded people were everywhere. Uh, by the time I reached uh, the place uh, or the center of the event itself, which was, which was the silos, uh, that bodies were, were there and people were breaking down, even journalists, uh, colleagues that I know were breaking down, crying. Uh, we tried to support each other while doing our job. This is something that I will never forget. But also in this, uh, in the whole mess of things, uh, when I first got the information, uh, coincidence has it that we own a business in shipping and I'm familiar with the port and many people in the port know me personally because of my father. So many of them came to me uh, to tell me what they know about this ship that uh, exploded. So I had approximately 60% uh, of what happened, what was the ship, what did it do, who was in charge of it, where was it? And everything and it was i remember seven uh, at 7 uh, 45 i was on air and i gave the information of the russian ship and all of this and it started going at 7 55 um, amid the mess and the people that were not buried and amid the the, the 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 collapse that the country was experiencing an officer came to me with a notebook i was amazed by his uh by his uh we say in French, etadam, his demeanor. He came and with a block note, he told me, I, uh, you mentioned something about a ship and explosive and, and, and can you please repeat it and point out to me who was the people who were telling you this information? This was their main concern. 50 minutes after the blast, they wanted to catch the people who were disseminating the information. Of course, the information, they had it because the port, they knew what was in the port. But what were, what they were concerned with 50 minutes later, it's not, it was not mainly only taking out the wounded or extracting those who needed help or searching for the bodies. Some were doing this. No, they wanted to know who are the people that I talked to and who gave me the information. Of course, I pointed him to the wrong direction and sent him somewhere else, told him, I think two, three people were telling me and they went this way. So uh, this was this was something I, I, I kept in mind. And it was, uh, let's say, an element that's to uh, that was very striking uh, amid the whole scene. So that says a lot about where we are today in Lebanon, uh, security-wise and freedom of speech-wise. Thank you, George, for raising this. And here I would like also to stress on the role of investigative journalism and investigative journalists. They are doing a really great job in Lebanon when it comes to uh, the investigation uh, pertaining to the Beirut blast, but they are trying really hard to break the spiral of silence. And here I will go back to the idea of accountability that was mentioned by Sharif. So we need accountability. And this is how journalists can push for this. So uh, we start started with Turkey and we will uh, somehow uh, end with Orhan and with Turkey. Orhan, uh, please, uh, your concluding remarks. Thanks a lot, Maria. Uh, what George said actually reminded me something because as you all know, we had an earthquake two months ago in which official numbers claim that at least 50,000 people, unfortunately, we have lost, but most probably it is probably more than a hundred and fifty thousand uh, in the first day actually in the first three days journalists were there they were covering the issue and they were saying that it is not on tv but trust us this is an extreme catastrophe things are not normal here at least in two cities they were saying that the city is not here we have lost the whole city Meanwhile, the government was saying that it's a minor issue. We had something, there are some casualties, but everything is under control. The state is here, government is here. We are everywhere. We are helping everyone. Then we, we, we understood, we realized that actually the government could not reach the earthquake zone before the third day, maybe the fourth. And meanwhile, the, the directorate of information was these are things they were dealing with, uh, employing even more trolls to oppress social media, diminishing, oppressing the bandwidth of Twitter. 
so that people cannot share the news, uh, making their news people, their own media to tell just funny stories or lies to their own base. And also, similarly, use the police to oppress the journalists for them. So similar cases. And I would like to end with something more positive remarks. Despite everything, I can see that there is resistance. So if we don't mention resistance, then it makes us some like passive, not even actors, but like some passive elements in an ongoing flow of history. This is not that. The West might see us like this because they always pity us. They talk about, whenever I go to the States or Britain or France, they're always like, will you be able to return home safely? Will you be killed? I mean, they will not shoot me on sight, okay? <laughs> Just let's put this, and it doesn't work like this, okay? we This is a country, this is a society, we are human beings. Uh, so, I mean, we have our own agency. Things might be bad, I know that. It looks really bad, but I can also see the trend, yeah? If 10 years ago, if we told what is now happening in the United States to any American, they would just say, no, this can't happen. It can happen, guys, okay? It, Germans also didn't know what was going to happen to them in 2035, but things happen. Things can happen, always can happen. And one of the first things that you need to look at is the media, yeah? There are many signs that bad things might happen in the West as well. And the clues, the things to learn are happening all around here. As in the case of George, there are syllabuses and teachers and the autocrats and populists, all those oppressive regimes are learning from each other. But meanwhile, we are here as well. There is resistance and there is agency and we have solidarity. And I believe that as long as there are people like you, like all of us, things always have the potential to be better. So I would like to thank you all for being here and for doing what you are doing. Thanks a lot. Uh, thank you, Orhan. We are not passive and we will never be passive. So thank you also for uh, the very positive vibes that uh, you were able to bring to us. Uh, Dr. Khouri, a final word before I conclude myself. Uh, sure, I actually agree with everyone about the togetherness the, and what Orhan said at the end, uh, that it's unfortunate that journalists need to be equipped with skills on how to protect themselves in different environments and even their own newsrooms. But I too remain optimistic with great minds such as yourselves and care that you do have for the profession and uh, development of our societies. So thank you. Uh, Thanks. Thank you. Thank you, Jessica. Um, thank you for this final word also. Uh, as we come to an end uh, of our webinar on the safety of journalists, I uh, really regret one thing that we were not able to touch upon a lot of uh, controversial issues also revolving around the same topic like uh, digital safety, like mental and emotional well-being of journalists. But I hope that in the future we will have other sessions uh, in order also to discuss these very important uh, themes under the same big umbrella of safety. So I would like to thank the audience uh, and I would like also to thank you uh, all our distinguished speakers for today. This was like a lot and the main takeaway for today I guess is to uh, um, really believe in our role as the agents of change and hopefully we will be able to uh, continue with what we are doing right now. Thank you.